talk about is the complexity of the immune system and try and convince you first of all that it is very complex and uh, try and explain to you why that should be. Why do we have to have such a very complex system and how do we deal with that? So the first thing I wanted to do was try and explain to you just how useful the immune system is to and I think we take it for granted a lot. Uh, there's a lot of diseases that uh, really are fairly minor problems for us and many of those diseases that used to be much more serious have uh, been basically fixed by a number of very successful vaccines being developed over quite a long period. And I would argue that vaccines are one of the most cost-effective things that medicine uh, has ever achieved. Extremely effective, low cost, and have really removed a number of very serious diseases. Smallpox, of course, is the classical example that everybody uh, thinks about. That's a disease that was actually completely eradicated. Polio has been reduced to a very low level, and it seriously suggests at the moment that that may be the next target for a disease that can be fully eradicated. So I wanted to show you a couple of very quick examples of how effective the vaccines can be. And the examples I'll use uh, are local examples. So in Rochester, uh, David Smith and Porter Anderson developed the so-called conjugate vaccines I'll come back to later. And these vaccines, uh, when they were um, applied, first of all, to Haemophilus influenza, they had a very uh, strong effect. There was, a, in the United States, for example, there was a certain incidence of the disease. Then the vaccine was introduced here, and immediately there was a very strong uh, drop in the number of infections. That's true in other countries. Uh, that pattern's been uh, seen both with this vaccine and with others. So a really striking effect on the incidence of that disease. And just to make things a little more precise, on the right here, you can see that uh, this was the introduction of a meningococcal vaccine. And there's different kinds of meningococcus. And this was particularly directed against the C strain. And so what they did was monitor the incidence of disease for both the B and the C meningococcal disease. And the one that was in the vaccine, that the vaccine was directed against in red, crashed very quickly down to very low levels whereas the other type wasn't really affected. So I think it's, uh, there's many, many examples like this saying that vaccines can be extremely effective. We have a lot of very good examples. However, we also have a number of examples that have been really, really difficult. And I've shown a couple here, very major diseases, HIV, of course, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, and even influenza, where we have a vaccine that's partially effective, but it's not as supremely effective as some of the ones that I mentioned. So there are a number of extremely difficult uh, infections that we still have to deal with. And it's not for want of trying that these diseases have been studied for many, many years, for decades, and it's still very difficult. So I wanted to talk about the complexity. And uh, the idea is that the, co the complexity of the immune system is something we need to address before we can get to dealing with these more difficult diseases. And a lot of people are very frustrated about this sort of complexity. They find this sort of a bewildering amount of complexity, and you know, why should that be? Why, why do we have so much uh, uh, difficulty? And I think that there's a couple of reasons, at least, why the immune system really has to be very complex so that it will function effectively. And the first of these has to do with just how strong it is. So the immune system will attack various pathogens that are trying to infect a person. And in it, to do that attacking, it has a number of very powerful mechanisms. And those mechanisms have to be applied very precisely, just enough, and not too much. Because if the immune system is overstimulated, it can very easily cause a huge amount of damage. And you know, one of the more extreme examples of that would be septic shock, where uh, that's an overstimulation of the immune system, which can kill a person in a few hours. So the immune system is extremely potent at attacking various microorganisms, but at the same time, it has to be held very, very carefully under control so it doesn't damage the host too much. And so the perfect response is that you kill the pathogen and you do as little damage as possible to the host in the process. And that would be, that would be really good if, that, if we could achieve that all the time. But obviously, it's very difficult to be quite that precise. And I think we need a huge amount of regulation of the system 
to bring everything into balance to, to achieve the correct choices on, on all occasions. And that's made more difficult by the second point I wanted to mention, and that is the idea that a lot of pathogens interfere very strongly with immune responses. And I've shown one example here. There are many, many of these examples. Uh, and it, I think it may be true that most or all pathogens interfere strongly with immune mechanisms. And the example here is that uh, if a cell is infected with uh, a virus, then uh, other cells of the, of the immune system here will produce a molecule called interferon gamma. And that interferon then binds to a receptor on the surface of the cell and instructs that infected cell to kill the virus. So it, it activates some of the, the mechanisms inside that cell that will kill the virus that is trying to infect. So that's a pretty useful mechanism. Obviously, it's, that's a disadvantage of the virus. So some viruses interfere with that process. There's a pox virus that makes its own protein, which is like a receptor for the interferon gamma, but it's a soluble protein. And it diffuses away from the cell and binds up and neutralizes all the interferon gamma before that interferon even reaches the cell to have an effect. So it basically puts up a smoke screen to keep the interferon away from the infected cell so that it can carry on growing inside that cell. And so that's just one of many, many examples. And so the immune system is normally having to fight with one hand tied behind its back, that it's losing some of its important mechanisms. And with any particular pathogen, it's hard to predict which ones it will lose. And so the system has to function well in spite of everything that the pathogens can do to it. And I think that's another very strong reason why we have to have a huge amount of complexity in the immune system and a huge amount of cross-regulation so that the entire system works effectively. So I wanted to go through something about the uh, complexity of the system just to try and convince you, not, not to explain to you what the details of that complexity are, because that would drive you crazy. Uh, <laughs> but I, I would like to just convince you that there really is a huge amount of complexity we already know about. And if we start off, um, yeah, start one back, starting off with the whole body, the immune system is distributed around the body, a lot of different lymphoid tissues. I'll focus in on a lymph node. And if we do that, then we find that there's a lot of structure in the lymph node, lots of uh, different uh, areas specializing in different functions. Uh, more recently, it's been possible to actually look at the, uh, the uh, movement of cells within a lymph node. And this has been speeded up. But you can see that the green fluorescent cells and the red fluorescent cells, the, the red ones are relatively stable, but the uh, green ones are moving around, interacting in all sorts of interesting ways. And to, just to show you on the right side, I think it's happening about there. Yep, there's a cell. When it recognized this gray cell, the, uh, it became activated, and you can visualize that by, uh, by that fluorescent signal. So these cells are moving around. They're interacting with each other. So what happens as a result? And uh, we're just focusing now on uh, individual cells. And the cells are, in fact, a lot more diverse than they looked in that picture. There are many subtypes of cell. Uh, again, I would love to talk to you in a huge amount of detail about what the next few slides, but I, I'm going to restrain myself and just say that there is diversity here. And of course, it gets worse. Uh, we know a lot more about the, the diversity of this system. Uh, the original cells differentiate into a lot of different types with different specialized functions. Looking just at this particular arrow here, the development of, of that one cell, then we can see that there, there's a lot of pathways both outside the cell, those signals are transmitted to the interior of the cell, and a lot of networks of interaction go on inside the cell in the center here. So again, focusing just on this one particular arrow, let's explode that up. And now you find it gets a little more complicated again. And we can carry on that process, because just looking at the, the process over here, uh, in fact, just this last little piece of it, we can explode that again, and it gets a little bit worse. And I finally, I think um, I'll just stop at this point, looking at even one part of that, that uh, previous one again. So I've gone through a lot of stages of zooming in on the complexity in the immune system, try and convince you that it is really a horribly complicated system. And just that, those are summarized here. And I could have chosen a lot of different branches. If I'd chosen different pieces of these diagrams to zoom in on, we would have had exactly the same effect. We could have expanded and expanded the complexity. And so a huge amount of work has gone into this over many decades. A lot of really very beautiful experiments we've done to establish all of these pathways and basically determine what all these arrows are.
And the end result of this is that the immune system then has to take all of this, integrate all the signals that it's been working on, and then use that information to, to invoke precisely the right mechanisms to then kill the invading organism. And here we have a, a macrophage cell eating uh, bacteria in, in blue. So that all works very well. And certainly for the earlier vaccines, the earlier applications of immunology, we had no idea about nine-tenths of this complexity. But I think to get on to the more difficult uh, organisms that we now need to deal with, like the, the HIV, tuberculosis, and so on, I think we need to understand a lot more about the complexity so that we can start to integrate all those signals and make sense of them and learn how to influence them to help the immune system in its job of, of getting rid of those pathogens. So I believe that we need much more help than in the past from a uh, computational analysis. The information I showed you has now got to the point where it's too difficult for us to represent easily. Obviously, if I tried to put all of this on a single diagram, it's, you, you wouldn't be able to read anything. And in fact, here is a, a computer-assisted um, diagram of some, uh, just a small part of these networks. And you can see that working with that isn't very easy for uh, a person to do anymore. You can ask a computer to work in multiple dimensions and to bring out uh, various interactive features of those systems. But they become so multidimensional that it's very difficult for us to directly analyze anymore. And therefore, we need much, much more help from uh, the uh, computational methods. The, the so-called field of bioinformatics is now growing very rapidly, and we really need it. There's another kind of computational assistance that we need, and that is derived from the uh, newer methods that have been developed over the last several years. Uh, we now have some uh, methods that generate really huge amounts of information. And that's good. People worked very hard to invent these methods that produce very large amounts of data in a short space of time. And obviously, the, the human genome sequencing is one very wonderful example of that. But we have many of these methods. And the amount of data is now putting us into overload in just the primary digestion of that information. How do we make sense uh, of those patterns? And I want to show you just one example uh, that we, where we've been working on flow cytometry. Uh, this is a technique where cells flow through uh, a laser beam or multiple lasers. And the fluorescence light they emit is then collected in a number of detectors. And all of the different fluorescent colors can tell you what particular markers that cell is expressing. So for each cell that goes through, you get maybe 20 different pieces of information. And this is happening at a rate of about 10,000 cells per second. So it's very easy to build up uh, populations, uh, information on these populations of many millions of cells, 20 parameters for each one. And now you've got a terrible problem, because we can look at two dimensions at a time. But it's very difficult to look as, maybe we can look at three. But four dimensions and beyond is, is very difficult. So I'll just show you very quickly uh, a very nice collaboration we'd have with uh, Gareth Sharma and Iftikhar Naim, where they have developed an algorithm that can help us with digesting this data and making sense out of it. And the program they've developed called SWIFT. Uh, and this is able to identify cell populations in multidimensional data, uh, 20 dimensions or more. And currently, we can throw at the program a population of 25 million cells, and it will pull that apart and tell us about populations as small as 25 cells. So we've got very good ability to reach in and look at these tiny populations. And many times, the biologically interesting populations are at that 25 cell level. So uh, if we look just at uh, one of these populations, there's a million and a half cells here. And looking at two of the markers in a two-dimensional plot, you can't see a, a whole lot of resolution. If we apply SWIFT to that, then this is what the program found was 467 different populations. And I'm just showing uh, six of those in color just to illustrate the kind of populations that it gets. So this kind of assistance is going to be hugely useful to us because doing this manually is, is either very tedious or, or it's almost impossible. And we now have a lot of these methods where they're called high throughput methods where we actually spend a lot more time analyzing data, a lot more effort there than actually getting the data in the first place. So I'd like to end off on the idea that we're, we're looking at a change in the way that uh, immunology and a lot of other sciences are uh, actually being done. In the past, uh, what I'd call the classic vaccines were developed without a huge amount of knowledge of how the immune system really worked. 
Uh, they were developed by trial and error, and they were astoundingly effective. So there's some beautiful work done on that. And that gives us treatments for diseases like smallpox, polio, mumps, measles, and so on, which are now at very, very low levels or, or completely gone. Then I would say there's been an, an intermediate phase where our knowledge of immunology did allow more design of how the vaccines should be constructed. And the example I mentioned earlier, the conjugate vaccines developed by David Smith Porter Anderson, those vaccines were, took advantage of the immunological knowledge of the time to construct a rather unusual chemically uh, linked vaccine, and it was remarkably effective. So I think that's one of the earlier examples of using this, this knowledge uh, and applying it very successfully. And I think we now have to go a lot further that way because some of these very difficult diseases like HIV and, and malaria and so on, uh, they are not yielding very fast to some of the more classical approaches. And I think that if we're able to use the new bioinformatics tools, uh, basically bring up a, a new generation of immunologists who are more comfortable thinking in these very quantitative, very multidimensional terms, then maybe we can get to the level of information we need so that we can design vaccines that will go after these very, very difficult diseases. And going beyond those infections, I think we can also expect to get much further into the diseases that occur when the immune system goes wrong. I would count cancer as one of those examples because the immune system does not do, it, it ignores the cancer too much, it doesn't uh, go after them in many cases. And uh, autoimmunity and allergy are two uh, major areas where the immune system overreacts and causes troubles, and we'd like ways of pulling that back in very selective ways. So I think for all of this, we need uh, a lot more help from the computational models, uh, large-scale data analysis, and integration. Thank you. Thank you.